Thank you everyone for spending this next hour with us. I'm uh, very appreciative that you're here. I'm uh, grateful and appreciative for my um, panelists who are going to be speaking with us today. My name is Shauna Haynes and the idea for this teaching came from many of the conversations, tensions, debates, comments, I know never read the comments but I always do, um, about racism and injustice that erupted with the murder of George Floyd. Um, for some people these this came out of nowhere for them. They don't understand why all of a sudden people want the Confederate monuments down, why all of a sudden there's a talk about police brutality or um, plantations or things like that. And for some of us, these tensions have existed our entire lives. So this teaching series is for those who are wondering what's going on and why now, and it's to empower and motivate those who've been in the struggle, and it's to educate all of us. Um, we're all working from home so or from work, so expect the unexpected, dogs, kids, significant others who can't find their keys, whatever. Um, this is organic, it's casual, it's a teach-in, um, and we'll just laugh and commiserate and learn together. So thank you again, everybody, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Reynolds, who is our moderator for this session, and she will introduce our panelists. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much, Shauna, and thank you for coming up with this incredible idea. I know I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be here, and I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people share my feelings. Um, so as Shauna said, my name is Lisa Reynolds, and I am the moderator for today's session, The Historical Foundations of, Sy of Systems of Oppression. Um, this session focuses on how racism in this country is foundational and how some of those earliest statutes were put into place. We'll also address the racial wealth gap, uh, a third reconstruction, and then finally the role of historic sites and the conservation, memor mor memorialization, excuse me, and education they provide, which are important to present day understandings, understandings of social constructs. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief explanation of how we're gonna to work today. Uh, we have three presenters, each of whom will speak for roughly 10 minutes and have about a 15 minute Q&A following. Um, although the chat function is live, we do ask that all questions come through the Q&A window, uh, which if you look at the bottom of your screen right now, uh, you see that green share screen, you'll see record and you'll see Q&A. That's how you pull up that window. And we do prefer all questions come in that way if possible. Um, we'll get to as many questions as possible each session, but it will be, I will be mindful of time. Um, we have live captioning available, which you can access by clicking the caption on the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll take a moment really quickly and just introduce our speakers. Their full bios can be found on the website. Um, but just for now, the first speaker we'll be welcoming is Sherry Frost. And Sherry has been teaching English and American history in high school, college, and adult education settings since 2009. She specializes in making material accessible to students who tend to struggle in traditional schooling situations. Uh, Carrie Lee Merritt is a historian of the American South and she specializes in race, class, and labor. Karen Bloom is an archaeologist and public historian for numerous historic sites over the past 15 years. She works to interpret for and create meaningful interactions with audiences through stories of the past. So without further ado, and without taking up too much of everybody's time, let's hear from Sherry Frost. Thanks. Um, all right, so my module, I'm gonna give you some pictures to look at. Um, let's see, there we go, that one, share. Uh, let's see, is it gonna let me do it? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you might just have to look at me. Hold on a second, let's see. Allow that one. Uh, later. Maybe. Okay, let's try it now. Ah, there we go. I bet it's that. There it is. Yay. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, in my module, we're going to look at some of the very earliest laws of the 16th and I'm sorry, the 17th and 18th centuries that began to form the legal framework for what was required to legitimize and codify the systems of exploitation that we call American slavery. Specifically, we're going to look closely at some of the earliest case laws in Virginia, Massachusetts, and South Carolina, as each of these three colonies approach the question of race in the law from very different economic and social standpoints. So before we dive in, there are a couple of things that I really want to stress that you remember all the way through all of this. 
Um, and one of the things that I've come to recognize as a lawmaker myself, I'm a state representative in, in New Hampshire, is that one rarely makes laws for, to address problems that don't exist, right? I was telling my husband this morning, we don't set gator traps in the yard because there are no gators in New Hampshire. So uh, certainly there are exceptions to this maxim, but laws are most often reactions to conditions on the ground. The second and most important thing to remember in every situation is that power protects itself. Um, in fact, power's primary objective is to protect itself. So knowing that, if we look at the social conditions in early America, very clearly delineated social strata become apparent with educated, landed, wealthy white men at the top, moving through classes that consisted of people like ship captains, solicitors, tradesmen, skilled laborers, white people, um, mostly men. Um, people generally thought of as free, though often without land holdings. Then there are servant classes um, that ran through uh, social strata. So white indentured servants were at the top of the heap, and then that followed all the way through to non-white servants, then slaves, with Indians being slightly higher on the pecking order than black slaves. The subsequent laws enacted in the colonies fixed this already established social order, both by legally stripping blacks of rights and by applying judicial restraint on behavior of whites, both rich and poor, in relation to blacks. Uh, let me hit play here. So let's hold on a second. Da -da -da. There, okay. Um, so the earliest known recording of the arrival of blacks in the American colonies is um, 1619, when John Rolfe, secretary and recorder of the Virginia colony, noted that about the last of August, there came to Virginia a Dutchman of Ware that sold us 20 Negroes. The status of these blacks was nebulous at best. While they were certainly not free, much of the population at the time wasn't, it should be noted. Neither were they subjected to the same kind of treatment that blacks in the colony would face less than 50 years later. The first judicial case to mention race in Virginia was the Davis case in 1630, in which a man named Hugh Davis was brought to trial for, quote, abusing himself to the dishonor of God and shame of Christianity by defiling his body in lying with a Negro. Note that the charge fails to mention Davis's race. The assumption being that the absence of the marker indicates that Davis was white, specifically because his partner in crime was not. The next case to explicitly mention race was brought about 10 years later and was likewise about breaking sexual norms. In 1640, Robert Sweat um, was brought to trial for, quote, having begotten with, a ch uh, with child a Negro woman servant not belonging to him the sentence for which was a whipping of the servant and a public penance at a church for sweat. The case doesn't indicate the status of the woman in question. It's possible that she was considered the same as an indentured servant or she may have been enslaved. At the time, the words were used interchangeably. It's also worthy to note that both Davis and Sweat were punished according to how all fornicators at the time were. That they were caught with their, in their crimes with partners of a different race was noteworthy to the recorder but didn't seem to be grounds for harsher penalties for the men. Um, the fear of alliance between what was called the underling classes was a motivator for a number of cases that came before the Virginia court and harsh punishments for white servants who conspired with blacks are noted in all of them. Two cases in 1640 stand out. First in Emmanuel, one black and six whites ran away from their situation. When they were all caught, each of the white offenders were punished with sentences varying from branding to whipping, and most had additional years of service added to their indenture. The black man was likewise branded and whipped, but no mention is made of additional service, from which we can deduce that he was already a slave for life. In that same year, in the Punch case, a black man and two whites likewise ran away from their indenture, and when they were caught, the white men were sentenced to additional years of service to the master and the colony but the black man was sentenced to servitude for life. It's important to note here that the sentence has no legal precedence. The court was codifying for the first time differentiated treatment of blacks and whites for the same crime. As the institution of slavery rooted in Virginia society, the colony had some kinks to work out between colonial law and English law. So in 1662, questions of paternity were settled when Virginia broke with English custom and ruled that the status of a child was derived from the mother setting any question aside about whether or not a child of a white master and a black slave needed to be freed. In 1667, Virginia cleared up the problem of the English edict against enslaving Christians 
when it decreed that baptism does not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom. In 1669, an act was um, addressed, that, a pass that addressed the casual killing of slaves that settled a white person could not be convicted for murdering an enslaved person. The reasoning here had three important components. First, they recognized that people subjected to lifelong slavery couldn't be punished for infractions by the addition of time on their sentence. They also believed that, quote, the obstinacy of any of them couldn't be suppressed by other than violent means. And finally, they reasoned that it was illogical to punish someone for the destruction of their own property. The white owner had every right to kill a slave as the only party to suffer a loss was the owner. There followed a number of statutes that allowed for violent treatment of blacks, uh, black enslaved people up and to including murder, but the focus for damages was always the financial interests of the so-called property owners. Um, I wanna do a quick side note here. In 16, 60, uh, 1676, Bacon's Rebellion happened and um, that was a sort of a touch point, a flashpoint for the wealthy whites because they recognized that the rebellion was able to gather up both white and non-white poor people. And there are a whole lot more of them than they were of the wealthy elite. And that was very scary. So that happened in 1676 and in 1680, Virginia passed a statute that would become a model for the whole of the colonies, Act 10. It forbade both Negroes and slaves from gathering, from carrying any kind of weapon, from raising a hand to a white person, even in self-defense, and from running away. This was the precedence for a catalog of laws in several colonies that would later, uh, that could later deprive black people of any of what we call basic human rights. Ironically, it was a colony in the North that would be the first to legally authorize slavery. In the 1641 Body of Liberties, the Massachusetts colonial authorities allowed for slavery of, quote, lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willfully sell themselves or are sold to us and anyone judged hereto by authority. But that these people were still entitled to, quote, all the liberties and Christian usages which the law of God established. Massachusetts colonists did a thumping slave trade. They recognized lucrative financial opportunity when they saw one and made good use of their skills in shipbuilding, sailing, and trading. By the 1700s, New England was the most active slave trading area in America. Local slavery was mostly penal though, and mostly white. However, it was rarely a lifetime conviction. Native people made bad slaves, the colonists would quickly discover, and often those slaves taken in those just wars that authorized slavery in the Constitution with Native people were sold to the West Indies, often in exchange for Black slaves. This was the fate of many non-whites who broke the law as well. By the end of 1660, there were some Blacks held in perpetual slavery, and the status was transmitted to their children, but all remaining records seem to indicate that even these people were granted certain legal rights under Massachusetts colonial law. The colonists didn't authorize the denial of basic rights enumerated by the scriptures. Non-whites, natives, blacks, and mixed people were often identified as property in tax assessments in the colony. And despite black people never registering as a significant percentage of the population in Massachusetts, white residents feared uprisings, legislated limits on manumission of slaved people, and severely limited the freedom of movement and association with non-whites, black, free, or bond. These limits persisted well into the 1700s when fears of, quote, meeting, conferring, and plotting persisted and were exacerbated by news of slave insurrections in the colonies. South Carolina was primarily colonized by immigrants from the West Indies who brought their slaver culture with them. As a result, black labor was heavily exploited in the colony from the very beginning. Indentured servants were scarce and served fixed terms. Legal protections for white servants meant that they were difficult to exploit or cheat. They could own property, they could sue their masters for poor treatment or insufficient support, and they were eligible for land grants at the ends of their terms. For these reasons alone, enslaved black labor was much more desirable for those landowners looking to turn a profit. Slavery was written into the constitution of the colony, stating that, quote, every free man of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over Negro slaves of what opinion or religion soever. 
Slavery was also encouraged by the headright system, which granted to each free person above 16 years of age 150 acres for every manservant or male slave and 100 acres for each woman servant or male under 16 who was imported into the colony. So by 1708, black enslaved people outnumbered white inhabitants in South Carolina. In 1712, South Carolina took to codifying its culture and economy into law with a series of slave codes, articulating the legal status of slaves, limiting slaves' liberties, dealing with the capture and treatment of runaways, and the treatment of the slave in the criminal justice system. The 1712 Act didn't just regulate the behavior of black people, however. For example, the Act instituted a pass system which obligated any white person to whip a slave found without a pass. A white person who failed in this duty was compelled to pay a fine. Interesting to note here that half the penalty was paid to the parish poor and the other half was given to the person who informed on the white person's failure to whip the non-compliant slave. White people in power in South Carolina recognized early that they needed to join cross-class forces in order to keep the majority black population in line. All right, so far we've only looked at legislation as far as the early 1700s, but I wanna to go to 1739 for a minute so that we can talk about the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina. Stono is often considered the most serious outbreak of the colonial period and as such spurred a lot of response in the law. On Sunday, September 9th, 1739 near Charleston, a group of 20 enslaved people broke into a store, stole guns and powder, killed the shop owners and le left their heads on the front steps. A group made their way southward toward St. Augustine, burning buildings, killing whites, and gathering new people as they went, and stopped for nightfall after traveling about 10 miles and collecting as many as 60 other people. Here's where the timeline is a little hazy. Either they were set upon by a group of armed whites that night, or they made it another week before being challenged, but the end result was that approximately 21 white people and 44 blacks were killed in the rebellion. The 1740 Slave Code, written in response to Stono, declared that, quote, the extent of power over slaves ought to be settled and limited by positive law so that slaves may be kept in due subjugation and obedience. The code defined those persons deemed slaves were, quote, declared to be and remain forever hereafter absolute slaves. The status of Black and Indian children was to be determined by the state of the mother. Slaves were treated as personal property, explicitly as chattel property. The code was also provided, also provided for the treatment of slaves. Not just anyone anymore could harm a slave without sufficient cause or lawful authority for doing so. And anyone found to have done so had to pay a fine to the owner, though would suffer no criminal penalty unless that fine went unpaid. Slaves could be lawfully killed if they raised a hand to any white person for any reason, but owners were legally compelled to see to the just treatment of their slaves in terms of sufficient food and clothing. Uh, it was rare that an owner would be fined or for failing to provide these things, however, as the slaves themselves were unable to bring the charges. Another white person would have to know about the cruelty and report it, be willing to file the complaint. So that rendered the law essentially toothless. So all of this basically just scratches the surface of the catalog of laws that were passed to regulate both blacks and what poor whites during the early days of our nation. And it's not difficult to trace the legacy of these statutes all the way up to legislation that needed to be overturned in the 60s and 70s and to customs that still persist today. And that's my chat. Thank you so very much, Sherry. Now I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, I believe we had a couple come through, but maybe pull back a little bit. Um, so I'd love to hear from, from the audience any questions that come in um, for Sherry and some of the content that she discussed. So I have a question. I, <laughs> I, will, I will add a question uh, while, while we wait for the Q&A to light up a little bit. Um, so all of this legislation seems to have been state by state, obviously, um, given you know, that we were not a union at that point. Um, what point, it, it, you know, do you feel that states were basing their rules or their legislation or their ideas or their concepts off of models that other states created first? Or, and if, if so, who was sort of the, 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 for, the front runner? Who was sort of the one that put everything out? Maybe it first? doesn't seem to, to me that they were basing their legislation off of one another because each of the, um, each of the states had different needs. Um, obviously the, the agriculturally heavy states that re, re relied on slave labor had to have a lot more 
regulations in place. They had to codify everything so they knew what, what was happening. Um, and sure. places like Massachusetts, slave labor was certainly there, but it wasn't as prominent and problems didn't arise that needed to be adju adju adjudicated in the law as often. Sure. Um, that, it seemed to change in the 1730s, 1740s, when we got better at disseminating information across the colonies and we started hearing about uprisings that were happening in other places. And it's interesting that after um, Stono, Massachusetts put in a bunch of laws, even though the population, the black population in Massachusetts never exceeded something like 2% of the colony, but they heard about what happened in, in South Carolina and panicked and instituted all kinds of restrictions on this 2% of the population. So um, it, was, it was mostly a state to state thing, but like I said, as we got better communicating across, uh, across colonies and finding out what was happening in other places, that started um, to change. We have a question that came in from David, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Sertzner. Um, when do we start to see anti-literacy and education laws get enacted? Oh, uh, that I can't really answer with any kind of certainty. Most of my um, investigation stops right before the um, revolution. Okay. So 1730s, 1740s is where I start getting a little hazy on the details. Um, recognizing though that in that period from 1640, 1650, when we first started really establishing colonies until right around the revolutionary period, most of the population was illiterate. So it was less of a concern perhaps then. Sure. Um, but I, I can't really answer that question with a date for you. I don't know the answer to that. Jamie, Jamie Haynes is asking, why has racial law slash injustice, excuse me, why has racial law slash justice not evolved more today other than power seeks to protect itself? That's the reason. I, you know, I mean, <sighs> The, the idea that one of the things that I sort of zero in on whenever I'm doing this is, of course, we, we're, we're all sort of indoctrinated with the idea of, you know, the, the, the rules that had to be put in place for slavery to succeed. But one of the things that I found missing in my own education that I ended up investigating as I got older was what about the poor white people, right? And the you'll see in some of the earlier laws that a lot of the concern was about making sure that the poor whites didn't join forces with the enslaved people. Because if anybody saw um, Bugs Life, right, that scene where Hopper explains, they outnumber us 100 to 1. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. Bacon's Rebellion really brought that home for the wealthy elite in Virginia. And that's when they started cracking down to make sure that, you know, black people couldn't be out after a certain period of time and you couldn't have more than two people gathered together at any certain time. And the idea was to make sure that these people didn't get together and say, you know what, my situation really sucks. Hey, so does mine. Maybe we should do something about that. Uh, thank you so much. Diana Rice is asking, I came into the talk a little late, but was there any influence from the Codes Noir established in France and French colonies on British colonial law? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, the Spanish seem to have a little bit more influence than the French did um, because there was a lot of um, cross commerce with the colony in, that became Florida. Um, and for a short period in, um, not really sure, Georgia, I think it was in the, um, the book that I took most of my information from, uh, there was a problem with um, enslaved people trying to escape into Florida because the laws there were generally more favorable to people who were enslaved. Um, Evelyn Lees is asking, is, there, is it accurate to state that voter suppression today is a direct manifestation of these early legislations? I would say that that's fair. Um, I think though it's, so I live in New Hampshire and New Hampshire is 
exceedingly white, like extremely white. And we have some pretty rabid voter suppression laws here as well. It's not the black vote they're trying to suppress here. It's the student vote. It's the young people. Um, so, you know, can you make direct straight line to every instance? No. Can you make a direct straight line to a lot of places? Oh, hell yes. You know, closing, um, closing places where people might be able to get ID, closing voting locations in heavily primarily black neighborhoods, um, eliminating early voting, eliminating Sunday voting, um, all of those things are, they draw a direct straight target at the black vote. Well, and, and, and actually it's, it's the Sunday is a good segue. Um, there was a question that came in, considering the church or church scripture played a role in enforcing slavery, um, how did the current religious authority at the time enforce slavery? Um, most of the very early colonial laws, particularly in both Massachusetts and in Virginia, where we have the most information, were based on religious doctrines. So the Davis case and the Sweat case were both brought up more as offenses against the church and morality than they were against any particular statute. Um, the, the, it's interesting, the, um, the law, and again, I don't have the dates in my head, but 16, let me see if I can find it in my notes, 16, 67, um, when Virginia cleared up the problem of do we have to free people if after they're baptized and accept Christianity because English law says that we can't enslave Christians and the church says that we need to evangelize and turn all these people into Christians and when we turn them into Christians we lose our property and what do we do and so the of course the the decision was made to favor again the financial interests of the wealthy whites that said, you can still, you know, you can still baptize your slaves, but that doesn't change their status. They're still slaves. Um, and that was actually brought up again, the idea that laws aren't made unless there's a problem to be solved. Someone had sued for her freedom. Key, I think her name was, had sued for her freedom, both that because she was the daughter of a white man and because she was a Christian and the colonial court found in her favor and people freaked out. If we let her do it, that means we have to let everybody do it, so we have to fix that. So those two laws happened in pretty quick succession. 16, uh, no, nobody remembers dates. Um, 1662 settled the problem of, hey, my father's white, because that happened a lot, um, settled that problem. The status of the child is transferred through the, the um, status of the mother. And then 1667, you can still become a Christian, but that's not gonna change your slavery your status as a slave. Um, Margaret Payne is asking, do we know anything about numbers? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how many Africans were not slaves or were indentured servants once they were free? Were there legal limitations on them as well? Yes, um, and one of the things that I didn't get into was how often the law regulated the behavior of white people. Um, in almost every colony, manumission, releasing your slaves from, from slavery, from the enslaved state, um, required your either posting some sort of bond for their good behavior or figuring out how to get them out of the colony. And this became a problem because where are they going to go, right? Um, so the, the idea that people who enslaved others couldn't free them in their wills or for any, for any other reason, unless they had enough money to put up to secure their, either they're getting the hell out of the colony or to, to um, ensure their good behavior. Um, actually, this seems like a wonderful, like Sherry, your, your talk was so great and there's a ton of questions here on the Q&A, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask if you continue to answer them uh, via via typing yep. the Q and A, and we can we can go ahead and move to our next presenter. Thank um, you. If that's okay. Thank you so much uh, for your for your talk. It was so so interesting and informative. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Carrie Lee Merritt, and she's going to focus on the racial wealth gap uh, as well as um, the need for reparations and pa and potentially a third reconstruction. So, Carrie Lee, uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much uh, to the organizers of this wonderful conference, um, to my fellow pan panel members, and 
to all of you guys for being here. So today I'm here to talk about why we need reparations and a third reconstruction. Yet in order to discuss that, we need to talk about why history matters and why we must be historically fluent to finally achieve some sort of justice in this country. So some of you may be wondering what I mean by reconstruction. Well, reconstruction is defined by several factors, but simply put, and I think that this is kind of the definition that we as teachers, especially to K through 12 students need to use. Put simply, reconstruction happens when the federal government intervenes in states. So reconstruction happens when the federal government intervenes in states, whether through constitutional amendments or federal legislation to expand civil rights for American citizens. And so most of you know that the first reconstruction uh, came on the bloody, hill, the bloody heels of the American Civil War, um, right after um, emancipation. So these are laws, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments. They end slavery, they extend citizenship to all men born on American soil, and they endow them with suffrage rights. And so these are incredibly, incredibly important amendments. And, but these amendments, I argue, um, will, would soon be tempered by violent and sinister forces of white supremacy. And, and much of their grave importance would be kind of pushed to the side um, until the second reconstruction. Now the second reconstruction, some of you uh, know it really by its name, the civil rights movement. It's really just another name that historians use for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And so that also accomplished quite a lot politically, including at the federal level, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, while these pieces of legislation certainly helped lead our country into modernity, once again, they've fallen short on an economic and a social level. So with the United States remaining the only developed nation in the world with such abysmal rates of poverty and inequality and with no real social safety net for citizens in need and no promise of a minimum or living wage for people, a third reconstruction, I argue, is probably our most promising hope. Um, and what I want you to keep in mind through, through this whole talk um, is that you know, during the second reconstruction, historians and humanists and teachers were absolutely essential to the movement itself, um, explaining, marching, teaching, um, fighting, really joining forces with these activists. So I'm, I'm really happy that we're all doing this right now. This is exactly what needs to happen to, to move the country further. Um, and so I'm here to argue that in order for a third reconstruction to have a real chance of breaking these chains of history, we need the guidance of historians and humanists and social scientists and all the people who have the data on, on how to, uh, not only what to ask for politically, but how to achieve those goals. So I'm personally from Atlanta, um, and I, I argue in, in most of my writings that you know, history is woefully relevant for the South. We're the poorest region in a nation of wealth. In the deep South, um, you know, Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, um, where the rates of slavery were at its highest. We're the poorest region within a region. We're the poorest area of the country. Um, and I think that really demonstrates the legacies of both slavery and the failures of Reconstruction. They're much, much more lasting and important um, than many of uh, uh, Americans acknowledge. And so due to this tragic relevance, um, a relevance that highlights the deep inequalities born from slavery and Jim Crow and the aftermath of that, it's becoming increasingly imperative for scholars to link the historical realities of the 19th century, um, of 19th century America, all the atrocities um, done not only to uh, black Americans, but native Americans and any sort of non-white immigrants coming to this country. Um, and, and to really you know, see, see the 19th century and look to labor issues there. Um, to see uh, a lot, where a lot of our, our present day problems are coming from. And so in multiple meaningful ways, the problems of the poor and working classes in the South, you know, particularly black people, but as, as Sherry mentioned, poor whites as well, um, uh, from monopsony and monopoly to unlivable wages, 
to a pitiful lack of collective bargaining rights as laborers and an ever-present threat of incarceration. Well, these have become the problems of the rest of America essentially now, and, and we're seeing that borne out day by day. Um, and so as Martin Luther King Jr. preached at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., in a speech entitled Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, he, and he preached this just four days before he was murdered. He said, we must come to see that the roots of racism are very deep in our country, and there must be something positive and massive in order to get rid of all of the effects of racism and the tragedies of racial injustice. So I just want you to think for a minute quickly about our, our first reconstruction and consider the fact that at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Black Americans owned only 0.5% of all of the wealth in the United States. Black Americans owned 0.5% of all the total wealth in the US. So that might be unsurprising to people um, given the time that most, most Blacks were enslaved, but here's the really important part. More than 150 years later, that number has hardly improved so that today African Americans still own only about 1% of wealth in the United States. Today, African Americans only own 1% of wealth in the US. So, and the, the main reason why this is, is because after centuries of slavery and oppression and rape, we essentially, the, the enslaved fought and won their rights as free people. And, and uh, we passed the 13th Amendment, but we don't issue any sort of reparations. And black people in the South are locked into, you know, most of the, the jobs that they had on the plantations with their former masters. Um, they don't have much of a choice while Black people um, are asking for their 40 acres and a mule, some kind of recompense for you know, generations of slavery, they're told no by the federal government. And at the same time they're told no by the federal government, white people in America are being given massive amounts of land in the West and also in the South through the Homestead Acts. Now the Homestead Acts are passed in, in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln, and they essentially give away uh, land masses the size of both California and Texas to not only uh, white citizens, but white immigrants from Europe, coming over from Europe. So at the same time, we're telling black people they're not getting any kind of reparations for slavery. We're essentially giving away land to free uh, to millions and millions of white people. And so we need to start thinking about um, the, the racial wealth gap in this country as a result of policy and of, of, government, um, of government decisions, of laws, not only at the local and state level, but also at the federal level. Now, um, in, in the effort of time, I'm gonna go ahead and push through to, you know, thinking about the civil rights movement. And, and one thing I always tell people to keep in mind when we're thinking about that is, you know, just to take the figure of Martin Luther King, he was, of course, you know, threatened and jailed multiple times, so many times throughout his career while he was arguing for political and social rights. But he was murdered the minute he really started pushing for economic rights. And that's something that I think um, we all must keep in mind that that is what really terrified the white elite in America was that push for economic rights with the Poor People's Campaign. And, um, and luckily, the, the whole idea of a third reconstruction, which I'm sure we're seeing the beginnings of right now, and especially with the protests of the last you know, month and a half or so, that they, they, they assure me, they give me hope more than ever that we're entering into this, this phase. Um, you know, we, we have to make economic policy a priority because without economic power, um, people don't have political power in the United States. And it's always been that way. And it has never changed because economic power has remained concentrated. And every time it starts, um, you know, evening out a little bit and we get a little bit of a middle class, um, you know, a recession happens, a depression happens, and things get completely stratified again. So in this push for the third reconstruction, which is joined together with, um, you know, the current poor people's movement under Reverend Barber, 
You know, we, we've just got to all come together. We've got to get this history out to people, make sure they understand the historical reasons for racial wealth inequality, um, the racial wealth gap, and, and make them see that you know, this was instituted by governmental policy and it can be fixed by governmental policy. So um, I'm happy to take some questions now. Awesome, um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of clarification on an earlier question. So if the, to the question asker, if this is not your question, I apologize, I'm gonna jump down. Uh, Rihanna is asking, is, is saying, I grew up and live in Metro Detroit. In the 19th century, oh no, Henry Ford purchased swaths of property from free and, from free and relatively wealthy African-Americans living in Dearborn only to displace them into poor neighborhoods and hire them to exploit their labor. Capitalism, capitalism seems inextricably linked to white supremacy. It seems all the recent bailouts reinforce this racism. To what extent do you think the third reconstruction will mean a dismantling of capitalism? Wow, that's, that's a, a great question. I think question, yeah. um, it's got to push us at least as far as the rest of the developed world, right? We're the, we're the only country in the rest of the de developed world without these standard social safety nets, without the right to health care, without the right um, you know, to parental leave. We're the only ones. And so I think that a way that you've got to tie reparations to a third reconstruction in order to sell it politically because you sell reparations as pulling a lot of um, you know, poor black people out of poverty, but then you've got to also figure out, well, how are we going to pull, you know, white people and other people of color out of poverty as well. So that's why you've got to join the two policies together, I think, and, and sell it as a package deal that we're really using all of this to, to lift people up and to have some sort of, you know, social democratic society. Oh, uh, wonderful answer. Okay, let's see. We have, um, Stan Frieda, would you say that the first reconstruction was working and would have worked if it was not intentionally and actively hindered by white racism? And likewise, the second reconstruction would have also worked if it were not hindered intentionally by white racists. How do you think a third reconstruction would work if it does not include some methods to present the active interference of white racists? I absolutely think that, um you know, maybe they wouldn't have worked perfectly, and especially without reparations directly after slavery, those amendments would have probably been rendered pretty meaningless um, uh, by white supremacy um, anyway. But yes, white supremacy was always there to thwart any, you know, we take two steps forward and then white supremacists push us one step back. And the one difference I, I really think for the third reconstruction is just, you know, look at the percentage of this country. This is why the white supremacists are, look at the demography in this country. That's why they are so worried right now. They know the demographics of this country are changing in 20 or 30 years. You're not going to need a majority white vote to pass anything. You're going to need as long as because you're going to have a majority of people of color in this country voting and you're going to have if you just have a small minority of white people voting for, for progressive issues you're going to have a win you're going to have a government um, built on a coalition of 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 what people really need and want we have time for a couple more um stacy brown asks do you see race as a construct beginning in the u.s as a way to stop multi-race class consciousness I, I think definitely um, something I write about a lot in my book, Masterless Men, it's something I really related to in Sherry's talk as well. It, there has always, always been a fear, um, particularly in the South, obviously given uh, the numbers of um, poor people from different racial groups banding together. And we see it not only during these times of, of Reconstruction, but also in, in, you know, during the populist movement in the 1890s. Um, Black and white people, black and white working men, farmers are coming together and really trying to, you know, not not be Republicans, not be Democrats. They're trying to form their own party and have some sort of political power as laborers on an economic level. And of course, white supremacists come back in and, and it's thwarted again. Um, so unfortunately, that is the history. I say there's always a chance of, of coming together um, and achieving something, but unfortunately, that 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 iron fist of, of white supremacy has always been able to kind of stamp it out before. Oh, thank you so much for that answer. Last question for now, and then I will ask if you could also um, answer, answer the remaining questions via, via typing in the chat. Um, but let's 
jump down to Mary asks, you say, um, you say the Homestead Act was giving away land to whites in the U.S. and immigrants as well. Was there something specific to race implied in the Homestead Act, or was it simply due to racial bias of those administering it? That's a great question. So I always say that um, there's nothing that identifies people by race in the Homestead Act. I, I argue that it is one of our first real acts um, that is racist, uh, is de facto racist, not de jure racist. It's not racist in the letter of law. It doesn't specifically you know, say that black people cannot apply for it. But given the bureaucracy of the situation, given the fact that, uh, you know, throughout the South, there was usually one land office that people had to travel for days to, um, you know, to start the process itself. And then, then the fact that you've got all these uh, freed and slave, you know, enslaved, formerly enslaved people that have no capital at all. They can't, you know, just set out West and go claim a piece of land because they literally have nothing but the clothes on their backs. So um, yeah, that's that, that's a great question, and and it's it's a really important one. Okay, Carrie Lee, thank you so much for your time and for, and for talking to us about your your subject matter today. I am going to ask you continue to um, answer questions in the via via the Q and A, and we're going to jump over to Karen. We're going to jump over to Karen Bloom, um, who is going to talk about historic sites and the conservation memorial memorialization and education they provide, and why that's important to the present day understanding of social con constructs. So, Karen, go for it. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much. Um, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Shauna, thanks for dreaming this up and putting it together and inviting me to participate. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a slideshow for you all as well, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, hopefully that's working. Um, so I work at Middleton Place. Uh, this is a historic site that is a former rice plantation on the Ashley River outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And it once belonged to the Middleton family as part of a network of 19 plantations across the state of South Carolina. This network of plantations enslaved over 3,000 people that we know of uh, during the nearly 200-year history of this family as enslavers. So if you take a look here, you'll see the mission statement, a little quick overview of Middleton Place. The Middleton Place Foundation is a private nonprofit educational trust. And um, just this past year, we actually formed a strategic planning committee and we revised the mission statement for the foundation for the first time in its history. This is the new statement. And the most important part there is in bold and italics. That is not my emphasis. That is how we write it as we present it to the public. As a nonprofit, we're not only tasked with preservation, education, and interpretation. Middleton Place Foundation is a place maker. We steward landscapes, objects, and stories so that anyone who seeks to connect with those things can. This means that we have a chance to use our historic resources to make an impact on today's audience and therefore, hopefully, on the future that we're all shaping together. Let me see if I can advance these slides this way. I can, cool. <laughs> sorry, right, playing with my tech, sorry. Here, so here are some images that I put together of the kinds of interpretation that we do. Uh, we do first person interpretation, as you can see Jamal there pictured. This is where an interpreter becomes a historical character within the time period that their historical individual lived. We do third person interpretation and individuals speaking about the people in the past in terms of he or she would have done X, Y, or Z, uh, as well as guided tours of the property, COVID-19 pandemic notwithstanding. When this property opened in, in the 1970s, just in time for the bicentennial, which makes sense because this is the home of a signer of the Declaration of Independence, the people who were telling the stories here were called hostesses. None of them are in this slide. Now, the hostesses were mostly white men and 
well, mostly white women, um, some hosts, and they were largely focused on telling the stories of the plantation owners and their lives. However, there is a stable yards here at Middleton Place that was rebuilt in the 1930s, and it became the center for African American history and heritage. The stories that were told starting in the 1970s in the stable yards were pioneered by four black women, and you can see them there from the top left. That's Martha DeWeese, Eliza Leach, and then down on the bottom on the left is Anna Perry, and on the right is Mary Shepard. These women were all still in the employ of the Middleton family when this property became the property of a nonprofit foundation. When the family vacated the property as a family home in the 1960s, these women and their husbands stayed on caretaking the property and eventually as um, employees of the foundation, telling their own histories and their own stories. By the 1990s, there was a call for a more expanded interpretation of enslavement. The call was heard and Eliza's former house, pictured there in the center, became the hub for the Beyond the Fields exhibit. And we also created a book and later a documentary of the same name to tell the stories of the enslaved here at Middleton Place. But even with an entire tour focused on the enslaved experience, that wasn't enough. Um, enslaved people occupied every inch of this property, every piece of the landscape, every building, and their presence needs to be felt everywhere. A segregated tour that could be and often was simply ignored by visitors was not the way to ensure that everyone received a more complete story. The past decade here at Middleton Place has seen updated signage across the entire site, including the names of some 3,000 plus known enslaved workers made visible in the spaces that they would have occupied. Over the last five years, our tours and printed materials have likewise changed in order to more fully integrate the stories of those in bondage into the stories of the enslavers. The Beyond the Fields tour still exists. It's still included with the price of admission, and I'm happy to report that it's actually being more sought out these days by more and more visitors, um, but it is still optional. And that's why integrating the enslaved narrative into every aspect of the visitor's experience is vital to our mission. As one descendant trustee reminds us, we can't have white history in America without black history and vice versa. Black history is American history. And these two stories are inextricable from one another. Eliza's house is also a place of memorial. It includes a panel on the wall that lists out all of those names of the enslaved people who are currently known uh, to have been owned by Middleton family members. It is a powerful testament to their lives and to their presences. And memorialization can and does happen all over this property. It's important that we provide quiet places throughout in order to encourage reflection upon and communion with this property, this land, this place. Middleton Place strives to be a contemporary community resource as well. We've been hosting a naturalization ceremony every year for almost a decade. This is a picture from last year in 2019, a federal judge confirmed 70 new citizens from 33 different countries. Unfortunately, this year's ceremony had to be canceled, but it would have been this past Monday. We also host at least one author presentation and book signing per month. This is a free evening program that includes both local and national authors who write on subjects relevant to the many facets of history we steward. This image in particular happens to be Adam Parker speaking about his book, Outside Agitator, The Civil Rights Struggle of Cleveland Sellers Jr. And if you haven't heard about this book, it is a book about the Orangeburg massacre here in South Carolina. We know that admission prices to Middleton Place can be prohibitive for some of our neighbors and community members. And so as we work now towards creating partnerships, earning sponsorships to be able to provide more free admission community appreciation days, um, a way in which we can create better accessibility right now is to provide events like these, which are both free and always open to the public. 
Another facet of our personality at Middleton Place includes not just engaging in scholarly research of our own, but being a scholarly resource for students. We provide yearly both local and international student internship opportunities, including a new partnership with Dr. Robert Bellinger. Uh, he's pictured in the bottom image there on the far left. He is the chair of the Black Studies program at Suffolk University in Boston. And he's also a member of the Middleton Place family. He's a member of our descendant enslaved community. Uh, pandemic notwithstanding, we anticipate getting another student intern from Dr. Bellinger on a yearly basis. It's also important to remain relevant to our professional peers. We've collaborated with the Wanawamalan West African Drum and Dance Ensemble. Captioners, I'm sorry, I didn't send you that one. I will fix that for you. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll send it to you. Um, and we've actually loaned this important object pictured here. This is Ashley Sack to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. That object will finish its uh, two year run at the Smithsonian later this year. So lastly, it's important that we, may, we remain a resource, not just for the general public, but for our descendant audience as well. Family reunions have been a thing at Middleton Place since the 90s, but since 2006, they have been a thing not just for white descendants of the Middleton family, but uh, all descendants of the Middletons, black and white. So all of our enslaved descendants um, are part of the family reunions. So this image is from our last reunion in 2016. This image contains over 300 people of over 900 invited and all of these folks attended. We're currently planning our next family reunion. It's scheduled for next fall, 2021. Oh, thank you, Karen. So, <laughs> <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Um, so what about these occasions? It seems incongruous to many, and I understand why. Um, why an image like this would help fulfill the mission of Middleton Place, um, Middleton Place Foundation, but it does. Uh, we understand the objections raised about sites of oppression as wedding venues. We understand that in the face of stories of suffering, the idea of creating celebrations like these is cognitively dissonant. For some historic sites, it just seems that there is little revenue alternative right now. Um, I cannot deny that the revenue from events like weddings, corporate gatherings, um, these help keep the lights on, they keep the staff paid, they keep the mission moving forward. The couples who choose to be married at Middleton Place are all required to make a donation to the foundation at the benefactor level. This has nothing to do with their wedding fees. It has everything to do with supporting the educational mission of the foundation it requires, um, it's designated for the operational and educational mission of the foundation, so it doesn't go to any of our operations costs for the weddings. And a portion of that benefactor gift starting this year is going to be designated for a new scholarship fund that has been established. The Middleton Place Enslaved Descendant Scholarship Fund, and that's a temporary name, um, has finally been funded by a generous donor and the first award will be given out next year. Uh, this scholarship has been established specifically for descendants of the enslaved community uh, here at Middleton Place or the child of an African-American staff member here. At present, we cannot afford as a nonprofit that receives exactly zero dollars in funding from local, state, or national government entities to cease holding weddings. We are a private nonprofit educational foundation. Instead, we try to treat each one of these as an educational opportunity, a chance to share our histories with an audience that we may not have normally encountered. Not only that, we can actively direct a portion of these funds, like I said, where we, where we are directing them to MP Eds. Perhaps in future, other funding sources will appear that will allow us to reconsider this position, but at present, this is the reality of the situation. Um, we are not a for-profit wedding venue. There are a lot of plantations that are. Um, 
that is not our main objective. It is not our purpose for existing. This supports our educational mission. We're not a state or federally, federally run site, and we haven't received a multi-million dollar endowment from a generous benefactor, but we can hope. Um, Weddings remain a vital part of our revenue stream, even as we continue to apply for and win grants, cultivate large and long-term donors, and look to other funding alternatives for, as we move into the future. Here, you know, I actually have a, uh, oh no, what? <laughs> I had a question that segued into that, but that's cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I tried to anticipate. We get these questions you know, a lot. Kind of are. Every time I approach, <laughs> jump in with a question, you <laughs> So we acknowledge that there's more to do. We absolutely do. Um, I'm trying to get my... Okay. Um, tour experiences here at Middleton Place still vary widely due to a number of factors. Anything from rogue volunteer guides who don't want to talk about this uncomfortable subject matter to visitors who are still actively choosing experiences which somehow diminish their interactions with the enslaved aspect of the site's history. There are still challenges to overcome. Another place that we can improve is through making the connections between the enslavement of Africans and African Americans in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, to the social injustices that are still present today. These are drawn sharply along racial lines, of course. That's what this whole thing is about. We're working especially through our digital programming, which is free and more widely accessible in many ways than a physical trip to Middleton Place, to explore the evolution of thing, themes like civil rights denied, the era of reconstruction, the denial of accumulation of generational wealth for descendants of enslaved people, voter suppression, district redlining, these are all themes that do have their roots in the earliest days of the institution of slavery, which is in itself a dynamic force that changed from region to region and time period to time period. The question facing someone like me is, how do we, in a 45 minute tour, explore and explain all of these topics? We've begun offering specialty tours. So far, we've largely stuck to the facts of history encouraging these contemporary connections to be made in the minds of the visitors, question and answer with guides, follow-up visits, other research on their own. Can I, as an interpreter, inspire you, the visitor, to explore more long after you've left my site? So one thing that we haven't touched on um, is the effect the pandemic has been having on our operations, but um, that's not what this presentation is about. I just want you to know that the effects are substantial. Um, we, like I said, created this strategic planning committee for, it was supposed to be for the years 2020 to 2025. We still have plans to move forward with all of those things, um, but it's, it must be noted that uh, some of these things have now um, been delayed because we're simply trying to operate. Right now we're currently at about um, levels about 50% admission um, compared to pre-COVID-19 levels. So here's what we're doing. Diversity at Middleton Place. Our action item in the strategic plan is to improve our presence on both the board and in the upper levels of staff um, and looking to ways that this can go beyond race to our LGBTQIA plus community as well. Uh, we are targeting historically black colleges and universities to recruit new professionals to come and join our staff. Uh, we need to act, take action on our enslaved descendant participation. We have to go beyond just inviting them to reunions, and we've already started doing this. Um, we want to recruit more uh, descendants of the enslaved to our board of trustees, consult with them in our interpretive efforts, and make sure that um, we are uh, really bringing all of the resources to bear. Um, that they can offer because it's important to um, get new perspectives and invested perspectives. Internship opportunities to continue those, continue partnership with Suffolk University and to continue to create opportunities for both American and international students. Yearly, we bring over a landscape student from the School of Landscape Design in Versailles in Paris and also a history or historic sites or cultural tourism student um, from the University of West Indies in Barbados. And if you know anything about Charleston, you know that there is a distinct Charleston and Barbados connection historically. 
uh, our scholarship has finally been funded. It's included in our five-year strategic plan and a donor has stepped forward to endow it. Um, so we're gonna begin awarding that annually starting next year. And our interpretation is still not fully inclusive. If you had a chance to read our mission statement, you will notice that it absolutely referred to indigenous populations, interpretation for which we are not yet um, offering. So we need to begin that interpretation. We need to identify and consult with existing tribe members in order to develop it. You know, at Middleton Place, we like to say that we're all about history, but that doesn't excuse us from considering our present environment. Uh, Amy K. Levin, in her 2007 book, Defining Memory, Local Museums and the Construction of History in America's Changing Communities, writes, today, museum staffs cannot focus exclusively upon their subjects. They must pay much closer attention to the social ecology in which they are embedded. Many people who generally care very little about museums use them as a jousting ground for extracurricular concerns. Almost 15 years later, this statement is more true than ever. Often that jousting about historic sites activities and whether they're appropriate for the site are actually important and vital criticisms and conversations, but sometimes they are exactly that extracurricular. However, if we want to be a community resource in the contemporary context. We must attend every single conversation and we must listen. So in short, as I examine this in a lightning fast, 15, probably 20 minutes, um, it appears that historic sites like Middleton Place, I know we want to be, and perhaps are obligated to be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and it always has to be underlying um, our mission, or rather our mission underlies all of that, helping people to better understand themselves and each other through this lens of American history. This is how we hope to do our part in creating a better and more equitable future. If people understand where they come from, and perhaps they'll be able to make better decisions about where they and all of us are, are headed. So thanks very much, everybody. I know that it's running over a little bit late, but I'm happy to accept your questions. If you want to see our website, it's there. If you want to check out the digital programming plugged into history, there's a link as well. And I'll provide these to um, the follow-up materials folks as well. So Karen, thank you yeah. so much. We're going to actually, I'm going to do my best to kind of take some of the questions and smush them all into one question. Uh, but I will ask if you, after, after our session, if you could continue to, to answer them via the Q&A through typing. Um, so I think, I think there were a few questions that came in that basically, um, you know, ask how you are handling maybe some more challenges to the subject matter that you're presenting. You know, visitors to the plantation may be pushing back when they learn, you know, particularly white visitors may be pushing back when they learn about slavery and their, and their, and their enslaved people and their roles, well, not their personal roles, obviously, but their, their descendants' roles and all of this. Um, and, and, and I mean, imagine it could become, you know, contentious. So how, how do historical sites like yours um, respond to this? And, and do you share those practices amongst one another? Um, we do, actually. We just had a really nice call with the folks over at James Madison's Montpelier last week to see how they were handling pandemic response and things like that. Um, but we do have sort of a network of peers that we speak with. And to be honest with you, I know that um, one of our local sites here in Charleston got pushed back on TripAdvisor about, I didn't come there to learn about slavery. And um, we actually don't see that a whole lot out here. Um, every once in a while we get visitors that say, oh, well, I'm more interested. I'd just rather walk in the beautiful gardens. Well, okay, that's fine and you're welcome to do that. But if you take a guided tour or read a printed material, you're going to be learning about some uncomfortable truths um, that need to be spoken and shared. So um, we, the answer is we don't actually get a whole lot of that, but if we did, um, we try to empower our guides. Most of our guides are actually volunteers. And that's one of the reasons why they're sort of reticent to even address the subject at times because they don't know how to address somebody that would come with that particular criticism or that particular um, 
objection. And so we've actually done some racial sensitivity training with a lot of our guides, specifically the Beyond the Fields guides, so that they should um, be empowered to answer those kinds of questions and do so comfortably and do so confidently knowing that the subject matter that they're sharing with people is important enough to share even through discomfort because people object in that way simply because they have a fear or a discomfort, something that they are othering, you know, in their mind. Um, so I hope that helps. I, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I, again, I am going to ask um, if Karen can follow up on some of on the rest of your questions in the chat. We've got, we have so many amazing questions today. Um, what an exceptional discussion we've had today. Thank you so much to Sherry, Carrie Lee, and Karen for sharing your time and talent, and for all of you, all of our participants, for, for, for taking, you know, time out of your, out of your day to become anti, actively anti-racist. It's a really exciting thing to see so many people participating in something like this. Um, keep in mind, this is a free conference and, and it's wonderful that we can offer it for free. So what we are asking is that you maybe take some of the resources, either time or treasure, and reallocate those to a few organizations. Um, our speakers, our presenters today have given us um, a few opportunities. Uh, Sherry is, is giving us a number of several books um, that she feels are important that we should check out. I'm gonna put the links to those in the chat and we will email follow up with those as well. Um, they are called in, in the Matter of Race, In the Matter of Color, Race, and the American Legal Process, The Colonial Period, um, and White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. I think we can all benefit from titles like those. Um, Carrie Lee Merritt um, encourages you to check out her website um, for the catalog of books that she has. They're fantastic resources, as well as her top 100 anti-racist books, just to get you started, you know? <laughs> Um, so those are, that's a really, really fantastic resource that everyone should check out. And she also asks if you're able to donate to Black Lives Matter. Um, it's a really important organization doing some really fantastic work, as we all know. Um, Karen uh, has asked you to visit your local historic site and, and take advantage of what those things can teach us and how important it is to, to learn about our history, however uncomfortable we are made by it. We, we owe it. We, it's, it's our responsibility to, to live through that history and learn about it. Um, and also, uh, she asks if you have the resources to donate to the Middleton Place Enslaved Descendants Scholarship Fund. This is not the official name yet, but, um, and I will put the contact information for the development officer at that site if you would like to donate directly to that to, to that organization. Um, I will ask you selfishly to follow Year of the Vote at Wilkes University. Our celebration of women's suffrage does not stop with just the, uh, the vote. It really does extend out into all forms of activism, particularly through art. So if you search Year of the Vote at Wilkes University on all social channels, you'll find us. Um, and thank you again so much for everyone for participating. You will, if you are registered, you will be receiving a lot of this information as a follow-up email. And I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to join us next Wednesday um, for Gender, Race, and White Supremacy with Heather Cox Richardson and Julie Knockoff. Um, as always, all this information is available on lighttruthcon.com or on our Facebook event group if you search Light of Truth on Facebook. Thank you so much for all for attending, and we will talk soon.